Hey there, welcome to the On Purpose Podcast with Brian Horvath. I'm your host, Brian Horvath, and I'm really excited about the content you're going to gain or hear today and the leadership lessons you're going to gain from my friend, coach, and pastor, Hal Mayer. Hal and I met years ago when he came into the church I was working at here in Tampa and spoke to us about three questions to ask when you're leading to help those you're coaching get better. And of course, anytime we help more of our leaders get better as a coach, we get better ourselves. And years later, he and I worked together at the same church I was working at then and had a chance to lead some teams together as well. So I really appreciate I really appreciate how coming on to the podcast and a lot of the lessons that he shared with me then and he shares with me on this podcast today, I'm still using today in my coaching business. So thanks a lot, Hal. Well, you're going to be blessed to hear Hal and hear the, the, all the wisdom he's learned from being a coach in sports, a parent, a leader at churches, and now a consultant coach and always does a great job speaking. He has a new book that he came out with called The Smart Ask and I'm really excited. Oh, yep, you heard that right. The Smart Ask. And I'm really excited about what uh, we're going to talk about today when you listen to this podcast. So enjoy. No matter if you're a coach or a leader or aspiring leader, parent, and so on and so forth, you can use these lessons, whether it's in person, face-to-face, in a group setting, on Zoom, or whatever, you're going to find value in today's podcast. You can get this book at Amazon. You can learn more about how at howmayor.com. And uh, again, thanks for hanging out and listening. Hi there. Welcome to the Your Purpose Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Horvath, and I'm grateful that you are here investing your time to listen today. The purpose each week of this podcast is to serve people like you and like me to know, live, and love the purpose we've all been created for. Each week as you listen, you're going to discover practical, emotional, and at times spiritual tools to help you know, live, and love your purpose. I'll be sharing from my life in an authentic, transparent, and genuine way, as well as bringing on guests and experts who will share their fears, failures, challenges they had to overcome to succeed to know, live, and love their purpose. I'm glad that you are here today, and I can't wait to hear from you about this episode. You ready? Let's do this. Wow. Hey, thanks for coming on today, man. It's a pleasure to have you here. Great to be here, man. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. You know, I was thinking about getting prepared, and I think I sent you a text a little bit ago about some of the notes I was getting together on uh, on the book, and I have it here right in front of me. The Smart Ask book, Look at there. which, by the way, I love the name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll let whoever's listening to I had to somebody the other day said, you know what that sounds a lot like? I said, yeah, man, on purpose. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's what I picked up real quick. Now, I don't know what that says about me or you. You're the author, but uh, hey, uh, nonetheless. <laughs> but I was thinking about um, the things I learned from you years ago. You know, when I, I worked um, at Grace Family Church here in Tampa, and uh, I met you there when you were pastoring, I think, Church of the Bay. And you came right. in uh, to give us a little, the staff, a little uh, coaching, a little leadership uh, training, whatever. And there's three things you taught us on that day that I still use today when I work with somebody, especially, or teams, especially in a quick, quick world that we're in. And that's the three questions. When they come off the stage or they come off a meeting or they come off any kind of uh, activity that I'm the coach for, or uh, come alongside them with, yeah. I say, what did you do well? Where did you get stuck? And what would you like to change for next time? You remember that? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Those are you... standard questions I use just to, um, just to help unpack. Because Here's why you ask the question. Yeah. When I ask what went well, what I want to know is, did they perceive what I perceive? And so what are they thinking? So I'm able to get that plus we're talking about the things that went well because probably 95% of it was great. Too often we focus on, I need to fix this, fix this. And Alan Stefano, who you know, one time with me, I jumped in after I'd spoken. I said, well, I need to uh, cut this. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. Don't cut that. That was the good part. Here's where you cut. <laughs> so you're, what you're doing in that process is just helping get an understanding of what they understand. And then you don't have to tell them what they already know. That's the biggest challenge with the didactic method. You know, people like to just do an information dump and think people learn that way. We know they don't. Socratic method, the questions, has been around for years, but uh, we haven't totally often understood how to use them. That's why the book uh, just focuses on one area of using questions. But questions is just a much bigger 
realm. For, for me, here's why. I want to develop people, not merely just be strategic with them, right? Strategic, I can do it. In my coaching, I mean, I've coached banks, churches, pastors, Bell South, gyms, some of those in strategic plans. But what I know is uh, I want to develop the person. I want to help them grow. And what I learned in my leadership in churches, if I'm telling people what to do, I may have the best idea, but I won't get the best output. There's an equation in the book that says uh, possible that PBI times BI equals ROI. Possible value of an idea times the individual's buy-in equals the return on investment. So if it's you and I, uh, and you're my boss and you give me an idea, it's going to be a nine. I mean, out of one to 10, it's surely at least a nine, right? Maybe a 10. But my buy-in when it's yours, I may comply. But I'm not going to go as hard because it's your idea. Uh, mm -hmm. You just don't get my buy-in there. And so let's say I, I comply, but I'm in a three. That's 27, three times nine. However, my idea I bring to you is not as good as yours. Let's say it's only a five. But what's my buy-in level if it's mine? It's 10 because I'm responsible. So that's a 50 ROI compared to a 27. And that, what that just allows us to do is focus more on developing the person than just being the genius in the room. Yeah, I, I love that, man. And I think that's, uh, gosh, you know, I think, what is it, mere Christianity. Uh, C.S. Lewis talks about one of the biggest things God hates, if not the biggest thing, is pride. And, man, we yeah. don't mean to leave with pride, but, oh, my gosh, so many times in my coaching, I've been like, ooh, I just told them. I never interacted with them whatsoever, had a conversation with them, and never got the best out of them because I didn't give them a chance. So, there is time to tell them. Yeah. But most of our coaching, and I mean, if, if I've got a, a, a teenage driver, I'm not going to let them not apply the brakes and get run over. <laughs> but that's not most of the coaching we're doing with individuals, right? They're trying to figure out how to decide. And if I'll slow down my role and ask questions, they'll get there and they'll own it. See, I think this is great. Hope you don't mind. And if you do, we'll cut sure. this part. But, uh, you know, that's why I want to interview you when you had more uh, grayer hair, because there's more wisdom that you're <laughs> saying, but you also should look at there. Uh, yeah, so cool, I man. definitely do. Don't I this hair? <laughs> I think it's whiter than it is gray, but I don't know. Well, you said it. See, I was using that method. Uh, there you go. <laughs> but no, seriously, really cool stuff. It really has blessed me. And uh, you're right. I think uh, people will tell themselves more, too, and not in a negative sense as much as going, hey, here's where I can approve. They already know it. And we just come alongside with them and help them get there if we think they should. Yeah. So a lot of leaders. Yeah. Or, uh, let me say something before you get there. Yeah. When they leave a meeting, everybody goes, boy, that leader was smart. That's <laughs> right. the genius just doing an information dump. But when they leave a meeting and go, I think I can do this. I, I think I've got this. Suddenly you've got somebody who's a multiplier in the room who's adding value to people and they're going out and solving the issue. Oh my gosh, I love it. Great stuff. Stuff we can use every day. So speaking of everyday use, I mean, I, you know, the book here, the Smart Ask book. Yeah. Yes, product placement. <laughs> um, so tell us about how this is so practical. Like, what, First of all, let me ask you, what, what caused you to write it? And then how do you see it being used every day by leaders from any background or doing any kind of leadership activity? Honestly, for me, I don't write about something unless I'm getting a lot of questions about. Uh, so I've got several things I train, but if I don't get people reaching back in asking a lot of questions, I just kind of lean back and say, that's fine, I'll train it. Because writing a book for me is really challenging. And I've got a friend who helped me do it. and I had six people who were editors for me. The reason I wrote this book was I found it extremely simple and practical. And I don't know if you know the guy named Bob Teedy. Uh, he writes Leading with Questions, the blog spot. He uh -huh. used to be, uh, well, he, he was a leader with uh, Josh McDowell. He, he was the CFO for his corporation. But he read my blog one time when I did a thing on He said, would you write something for mine? So I did. Then I turned it into a book and he promoted it that way too. But he really pushed me on that. And I realized, you know what? It's a simple path to follow. When you read the book, there, there's you know very few large ideas. It's all simple, but it's a process that shows you how to take somebody from a problem and leave it as their problem. And then when they leave the room, it's 100% yours. You don't own it as the boss. Woo. I remember reading uh, One Minute Manager Meets the Monkey. That was, that was impactful, too, in that regard. How many times I, I was doing that as that a book. follower? Here we go, boss, solve it for me. And then who, who learns anything? Not me, for sure. Well, here's the funny thing. 
Ron <laughs> Sylvia will tell this story. He's the lead pastor at Church of the Springs. And when I was executive pastor there, he said, I was always amazed. You came into meetings and took no notes for yourself and everybody left with an assignment. <laughs> I said, yeah, that's my role. I'm not supposed to do stuff. I'm supposed to get other people. But he would invariably say, well, let me get back to you on that. And he'd just take a monkey. And I never taught him these principles so I was leaving. And he started laughing. He said, I was grabbing monkeys all the time. I said, yeah, my point of view is if I'm the leader, I don't hold monkeys, I shoot monkeys. You leave the room with your monkey. I'm not going to take it. And what it does, it keeps ownership in the right spot. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I would. I felt like uh, if it was the B, it's up to me kind of thing. I don't know. You know, I know right. in some regards, you know, responsibility in, in that but sure. kind of project. I'm like, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'm like, whoa, let's keep this hand lower there. <laughs> right. Good stuff. So speaking of that, so we've talked about a couple experiences. Obviously, we both had in church world. You've impacted me and um, and many others. Um, who is the book for? You know, we don't want to keep it so focused on ministry work per se. But I, as I'm reading yeah. it, I'm going, oh, there was an application. There's an application. Who, who's the book for? How can it be used? Yeah, the book has got a ministry baseline as far as the story where it evolves. But it's not simply a ministry book. I use it in my coaching with corporations. Uh, I mean, I'm coaching a... a a senior adult community owner uh, that's in Ocala, a large senior adult community, coaching her and her top leaders. And I use the book with them uh, and, and others in that realm simply because it helps the leader. I use it, uh, I do training, uh, consulting, training, development for a large gym in Ocala and uh, used it with their leaders to teach them to stop solving their employees' problems but help their employee with questions get there. Because often what happens is there's so much going on, it's like this mist, and they can't see what's clear. But with questions, you mm. can focus them. I give this illustration in my book that I didn't believe would work. I was in a training session years ago with Bell South, and uh, we were being, it was part of Train the Trainer, some content we were going to be delivering, training rather. And uh, the guy talked about, you know, you can use questions. And he used a trash can with a, uh, a, a tennis ball. And he said, see how many you make out of 10? And, and then he kept telling me, well, this will work too with your anything. So I went home. I said, okay, I'm going to prove him wrong. I got out of the basketball court with my son, who was about 12 at the time. Pretty good basketball player. You know how. Um, and I said, okay, son, get over there on the wing. See how many shots you can make out of 10. I'm going to count for you. And he made four out of 10. I mean, you know, there's pressure. I got to make it and all that. I said, okay, don't worry about how many you're making right now. And then as he shoot, I said, tell me what you notice. Well, the ball's spinning this way. Okay, shoot me. What else are you noticing? And I got him just answering questions and stopped thinking about it. He had, his muscle memory was good enough. He hit 10 in a row. And what I realized suddenly was questions remove the fog of pressure. And so what you can do, focus somebody in. I do this. The book actually takes place in a 45-minute uh, coaching session in front of 50 people. And I uh, use that often because what I know, I can trust the process and questions will get me there. I just did a training at Exponential and did the same thing in a room with 60 people. And I had one person come up and I said, okay, you and me. And I went through it and we landed, she landed with her, her uh, uh, plan and left the room because at the end of it, you actually put a strategic plan together for them. You know, the question is, so if you're going to do this, what would you need to do next? Right. Okay, after that, what would you? And I'm writing it down, and I tell them at the front end, I'm going to give you this paper. This isn't for me to put in my pocket. And then I'll ask them, any problems you see? Well, I made to make sure I get permission over here. Okay, anything else? No. Okay, so what's next? Well, I'm just going to do it. Great. Let me know how it goes. Right. And that's a whole different model than what so many of us grew up under the expert model of leadership. Most of us get promoted because we know a lot and do things well. The problem with that is our next role is to get other people to do things well, not merely just be the smartest person in the room. A book I'm reading for a second or third time right now that I'll read every year is a book called Multiplier. Um, and it just talks about the principle of people who are multipliers and those who are diminishing. Mm. They build the whole thing in the process. That's where that genius idea came from. Uh, they said, if uh, if you leave a meeting and you're the smartest person in the room, you didn't leave well. It just talks about how to get buy-in. And what they found out was a diminisher is not a mean person. And sometimes right. it's accidental. 
but a multiplier gets two times the return from an employee that a, uh, a, a diminisher will. And it, it's steeped in research. Uh, and it's just, it's really, really neat uh, what they get into. So Greg McEwen and the lady, what's her name? She's, ah, she's brilliant. Ah, uh, I forgot. I feel terrible now. But anyway, they write the book, they co-author it. And it's a lot of research based. So there's a lot of quantitative research to come out with this whole idea. So is, it, is this the, the same with McEwen as essentialism? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You read his first book, Essentialism, you go, what else is he on? Yeah. And uh, <laughs> multipliers. It's, okay. it's just a great book. Now, it's, it's, it can be long, but it's very practical at the end of every chapter. All right. How do you become a multiplier here? How do you, how, what's, and then they've got a whole chapter called Accidental Diminisher because the basic idea is nobody intentionally wants to diminish people. But here's how we do it. And then it suggests a 360 or something like that. Okay. To dive in with employees or one on ones to dive in and find <clears> out <throat> where am I becoming an accidental diminisher? So pretty good stuff. Yeah, it's very good. It's funny. One of the questions that I had written down for you is I know <laughs> this definitely doesn't work with my wife. Let me just say this right straight up front. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that what else? Well, tell me more. What else? You know, and uh, I have to remember um, where the audience is I'm using that for. But how do you think that lands with a lot of folks? So we know the limiting beliefs that we all can have. We, we all can have them. But, yes. you know, and usually in, in, even in sales, right? So on my own or my own businesses, you are too. There is a sales element as solopreneurs, entrepreneurs, or whatever you want to call it, have to go through. We, we own that arm too. How do right. we get to the real, we call it in sales opposition or real opposing issue? And, or how do we get to the, the real in-depth limiting belief that somebody has uh, that you're coaching? Is it those kinds of questions or is it a combination of that? It is. And something that will also help you. Another book that's very good hey? Uh, it's it's the book called Never Split the Difference. Hmm. Uh, the best negotiating book I've ever read, period. And it's not about manipulating people. The guy that's really interesting. The guy was an FBI um, <laughs> uh, invest negotiator for terrorists who took people hostage. Yeah. And he said, you know, if they've got four people and hmm. they say, okay, we'll give you two and we'll kill two. He said, that's terrible. So don't split the difference. And he just talks about using questions in there to find what the real issue is. And I do that with coaching because I'm not everybody's coach. And I don't want to coach somebody if I can't help them. And I, what I've found is when I'm coaching, it's draining. And it's great when I pass them off. Because I want to coach people I can add value to. So right. I'm not everybody's coach. But um, that's I've just found is if I'm, if I'm going to coach you, I'm going to say, okay, What's your biggest hindrance to growth? Where's the bottleneck in your organization? Because oftentimes what we do is get this laundry list of things that we need to fix. But the bigger issue is there's one bottleneck. And so that may be a conversion of, of, of uh, possibly uh, of sales or whatever that is. But whatever it is, address that first. Because the problem is when we address everything else, you get micro changes. Mm. If you knock out the bottleneck, then you got a chance for a major. And I think that's the case with every organization. So I try to find out what the real issue is. Is it uh, development they need? Or is it they've just got a bad business right now or, or whatever that is? And from that, then we can work something out. One of the things that's been neat for me, I'm now on staff with two churches part-time and on staff with, uh, um, as a leadership development person, on staff with the senior adult community. It's uh, in Ocala, I mentioned, uh, there with, with development for their team. And I like that uh, arena because it gives me a better feel for what's going on. When I'm coaching somebody's whole staff, I've got a better idea of what they're doing. Now, I'll do development maybe with, uh, with the staff, but with a lead pastor, there's development, but there's also, okay, what's your pressure point today? What's the one thing we can talk about that if you walked away with some help, yeah. you'd feel like this was successful? That's so good. mine is not a lot of content driven, although I do content. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll use a book often as the content jumping off place. Uh, I'm coaching a guy who's owner operator, Chick-fil-A. And right now uh, we're in a book, but we just do a chapter at a time. And then we, I, I, and I let him lead it. 
the, the thing I won't do is, is do all the leading. So I, he'll share and I'll ask questions. How's this happening in your business? Where's the gaps? Where's the hole? It allows him. And the challenge is when you often get higher in the organization, there's fewer people you can talk to. And so this gives him a chance to say what he's really gut level feeling. Sure. Uh, same with a senior pastor or somebody like that. So I've enjoyed that edge of it because it is fun to get to the real issue. And often what's presenting is not the issue. Yeah, that, that, that's that's a really good point, man. I think just that the the underlying objection or the hidden objection, and, and like you said, you know, we overuse this term, I think, a lot, the safe space, but literally, obviously, as right. you build rapport with this coaching and that's what I love too about the content you said. So for coaches that are listening to this out there, and there's a lot of folks that I interact with that are coaching others as well, like you do. Right. It, what a great point to that. Let's start with something that's common and it's third party. But I find really quickly, it gets away from that. Almost to the point where my analytic nature is going like, no, we have to stick to the content. <laughs> and it's like, really, they don't, that's not what they're there for. They're there for yeah. that, those conversations that are real, that are really that's happening right that now. Equation. That's why that equation is so yeah. important. Yeah. Because when it's their idea, if you and I can ask questions and get to their issue and their idea, they're fully engaged because they want to grab some handles. Right. And it's been very interesting coaching Chick-fil-A. Right now, as most people know, it's horrible trying to get workers in you know, uh, service jobs or, or uh, in restaurants. Yep, hospitality. And he went through a time where he lost half of his leaders, and he was finding new ways to get more done which that's one of the advantages of a downturn. You have to get creative and, and you have to start finding out what your keys are. Right. And, uh, but, but watching him come back now because he's building a culture in the organization. It's fun. Really sharp guy. That's awesome. Yeah. And they're going through fast. They got to make decisions fast and furious and uh, they got people. It's waiting. unbelievable. I don't think I've been by Chick-fil-A without a driving line. <laughs> Heck no, but you know, the speaker, uh, here's a secret, just insider, make it worth the podcast. Yeah. Order on the app and you go you go in the store and it's, from the time you order it, it's put in. So you can go to the store and go to the front of the line and pick up your order. Yeah, get There's hot. No wait time. And it's hot. <laughs> yeah, it's hot. Yeah. So. Cool. Hey, so one of the things I was thinking about too was, um, you know, the, the the fog. You mentioned the fog, you know, so many times, especially today. There, there are so many great leaders going through so many new challenges and different challenges, but at the root of it, it sounds like a lot of it from what we're saying is the same opportunity, but we do hit this fog. We do hit this stumbling block or we hit this almost like we tie our shoelaces together kind of thing. You talk about it in the book, describe the fog and how does someone understand that they're in it and then allow themselves to rise above it. You know, the common illustration of that is a mule that dies of starvation between two bales of hay. You can't make a decision. <laughs> and for us, it's usually more than two bales of hay, but there's several things that are important that are hitting, some are not important. They're just in your face and you've got to distill out. What should I start with? And then what's next? And sometimes by the time you get to the third thing, it's fixed itself anyway. Mm. But the challenge for people that are high producers in type A is they want to fix everything. They want to deal with everything right now. And they, they want it microwave. And the truth is development takes time. Organizational culture takes time. And change takes time. I mean, you, you can't flip a switch and suddenly everything's better because you've got a people environment, you've got a customer environment, and you, you've got to work within that. So what I've seen happen is people, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll talk about the gym. Uh, they had several struggles. Uh, employee engagement with the people walking in the door. Uh, employee engagement with people on the floor. Um, getting people to sign up for extra classes right. and PT, personal training, and all that. But what we had to distill was what's most important now. You know, that's the Lou Holtz thing. What's important now? A win. And so you thought, what is the most important thing right now? And the, I'm, actually, I'm going to do a, a strategic refresh uh, with them in a week. Mm. And because they've had a lot of turnover on their staff, he's really in a good spot right now. And I want to ask them again. Because to get their buy-in, they have to agree on what's important now. And it can't just be the guy at the top who owns it and says, this is what's important. Get their buy-in. Get them acting like owners. And they feel that way when you not only listen, but you sometimes are going to adapt what they say or give them ownership. 
I mean, I love what they say in multipliers. Give them 51% ownership, which means the outcome is on them. Yeah, I'm a part of it, and I want to hear it before you go, but you make the final decision. When you start doing that, you find you're making fewer decisions. One of the pastors I'm coaching is in a fog right now. He's so busy doing everything. So I said, yesterday, I said, do this. Why don't you take and list out what you're doing weekly in slots? Yeah. And show me what that is. Because one of the ways to grow in that environment is you got to start behaving like a larger church if you're ever going to get there. Because what it takes to become the church size you are will keep you there unless you learn new leadership. Right. So we're going to do that and walk through because he was telling me some things he's doing. I said, man, why are you doing that? <laughs> why are you doing that? Right, right. And, and it's because he's always thought that. I said, okay, what's the best use of your time? You got some people who can do that. So what's, what can you do that nobody else can do? Well, that's very few things. And when we focus on that, the, the other side of that is uh, the working genius stuff with Lencioni right now. Mm, I just mm-hmm. went through their uh, leadership training for that. I love certified. That. It is so valuable. You got certified in that? Everything. Yes. Okay, cool. All right. Yeah, it, it ties everything together uh, from all the other books. And it's just so helpful because one of the things it says, everybody's got two geniuses and everybody's got two draining areas. Okay. And then everybody's got two areas. They're just kind of in the middle that flow. The, the challenge is we may be good at stuff that drains us, but it doesn't, it's not life giving. So what he's right. talking about is helping people get in the right seat on the bus. If that's your term, but doing things that are more life giving than draining. Because the truth is, what's draining to you is life giving to somebody else. So uh, yes. if you're interested, in that, he hadn't had the book out yet, but his podcast covers it really well. Oh, that's terrific, man. I um I love him. I just love the fables. Not the fables, what are those called? The parables. Yeah. You know? I yeah. Love, like yeah, I love that reading style. It helps it stick. Um you know, yeah, I like, use this five yeah, dysfunctions. Yes. Uh, yeah. A lot most corporations when I start I start with that. Just okay. to start getting them to peel off the layers and figure out if we're really going to build a culture that's going to grow, we're going to have to build in these different levels, trust, right, communication, uh, all of that. So it's kind of neat. Yeah, and if you're a leader out there, a coach out there, or an aspiring leader or coach, uh, Lynchio has got some great stuff. And I think Hal, you alluded to a podcast yes. you can get from as well. And it just really helps you see others, but also yourself. <laughs> right. You know? Right. Um, I drew this little cartoon here. If you could see it, probably not. But um, – I thought about your um, the conversations that you know, oftentimes think about having one-on-one coaching, but a lot of these conversations can be done in group coaching. So i.e. Right. one to many. And so I'm getting a lot of revelation on that here. Just working with you today on, on some of those. It's actually uh, doing group coaching is even less draining for the leader because you not only can talk about some principles, but then you can put them together. And say so you talk about it. So, example, if I was talking about diminishers, yeah. I'd talk about a couple bullet points, let them talk about it, talk about what they see is is looks like that, and say, okay, now get in pairs. Right. Uh, each person tell their partner one thing that they're an accidental diminisher on, <laughs> and you start getting feedback. Yeah. You know, so often we're flying blind because we're not getting feedback. You know, what's root worse than getting the truth? You know, not getting it, right? Right, right, right. And so uh, feedback, you know, as I disclose, then I can get feedback from them. And then we start this whole culture that uh, engages feedback and wants it, which is those three questions start the whole feedback cycle. What went well? Where'd you get stuck? What would you do different? And when people find out that's a ladder and not a hammer, to use Ken Blanche's illustration, Mm -hmm. they want it. Quick illustration. My daughter is in the third grade, and she's getting ready for a uh, literary contest where you read a poem and the person who does it the best, you know, wins the class and they go in the competition. Well, she came home and she decided on Sarah, Cynthia, Sylvia Stout would not take the garbage out. I still remember that because I heard it so many times. That's the title. (laughs) But anyway, she read it to me the first time and I said, I like it. Ash, can I give you some feedback? She said, yeah. I said, what if you could make that a little more dramatic? So she said, okay. And she worked on that and she came back again two days later and 
and read it. I said, you know this pretty well. What if you memorized it? Then you wouldn't have to look at anything. So she did that. She nailed it, won all her little things. The next year, she comes home with a book, said, Dad, the competition's coming. Let's you and I pick out the best poem for me. And so what happened was she saw feedback. It's not, you did that wrong, you did that wrong, you did that wrong. But rather, it helped her win. One of the challenges in feedback, sometimes we're trying to establish ourselves as smarter. Mm. You know, somebody says, well, I, I made $10,000 in sales last month. You know, that's pretty good. But when I was doing your job, I made <laughs> half a million dollars in sales. That doesn't motivate anybody, you know? So. Wow, what a great podcast, my friends. An amazing resource that How Mayor is, has been to me and now is to you. And of course, I hope and pray that all these lessons you learned today will guide you personally and professionally. And you don't just keep them to yourself. You get to share them with others because that's what living on purpose is all about. So I hope today you got more insight into knowing, living, and loving your purpose. Again, I'm Brian Horvath and thankful for you being a part of today's show. Mm-hmm.